Chapter 2 Place, Dreamland, Area 51 Date, March 2005 Peter Roberts had arrived at Nellis Air Force Base in the spring of 2005, just about six months before the team from Gauntlet had been terminated. He had moved into one of the little ATCO trailers, outside of the main hangar line, and met the other two individuals assigned to that point, to hail humanoid artificial intelligence life form. Don Zaleski was in his early 50s and had been around robotics since the beginning of his career in the 1970s. He'd started off messing around with computer chips as they had evolved, but eventually he'd been drawn into the world of robotics development. He'd bounced around different companies, but had eventually landed at Dreamland as the CIA recruiting team had learned about his proficiency in the field of robotics. Robert soon learned that there wasn't much about robotics that Zaleski didn't know or couldn't build. He'd been hired about a year before Roberts and had already put together a couple of functioning legs and arms that may or may not be used later in the fully functioning model that they could and would move forward and build. The arm that Zaleski had built was virtually like that of a human arm and hand. It had all of the same joint parts that a human arm, hand, and shoulder would have, but they were made of titanium. The labs in Dreamland had amazing 3D printing technology and could turn out parts in overnight runs if the engineers had the specifications loaded up prior to their day shifts ending the day before. Normally, the engineers would churn out a project on a smaller scale, but fully functional. This saved both time and materiel. Still, even with the scaled-down models, the capabilities of the smaller robotic arms and legs was impressive. The titanium arm itself was something to behold. It was mounted on a stand on a table, and when the camera was interfaced with it and it was given instructions, it could rotate its wrist, spread its fingers, and then pick up an object without crushing it. This was a major breakthrough that Zaleski had been working on for months. It was one thing to have a mechanical arm move forward and touch something, but it was exponentially more difficult to have the arm move the hand forward, open the fingers, and then close them with just enough force to pick up the object. Zaleski had been driven close to madness as he continued to work to program the arm to complete all of these tasks with the mechanical arm. Brad Jennings was the third member of HALE, the Humanoid Artificial Intelligence Lifeform Team. His specialty was AI, or artificial intelligence, and he'd been with the team for just over a year when Roberts joined. Jennings was brilliant, but quiet. In fact, it was almost impossible to get him to speak, but when he did, his words were always well-considered and appropriate. As Peter Roberts got to know Jennings, he began to believe that Jennings saw the artificial intelligence program that Jennings was working on to be a part of himself. The AI could do things that Jennings couldn't. It could learn very quickly, and then it could interact with humans in an easy manner, something that Jennings couldn't manage. The AI could go forward in the world and discover things in ways that Jennings couldn't himself. In a nutshell, Jennings was trying to create an alter ego that he could unleash on the world so that it could experience what Jennings himself was too shy to try. The first models of AI that were available in 2005 were hindered by computing power. At a time when Apple was delivering the iPod to the world, Jennings was already imagining something similar in size to an iPod being able to learn about the world and having a capability to become self-aware and register self-determination. These were lofty goals for artificial intelligence programs, and Jennings had learned early in his career, which was only two years old at Dreamland, that other people were a bit spooked when you started to speak about artificial intelligence even fellow scientists working at Dreamland. There had been several occasions when Jennings had been in the cafeteria at lunchtime with other occupants of Dreamland, and the subject of AI had come up. Jennings had often found himself on the defensive side of the conversation. He recalled the conversation from the week that he started in Dreamland, and it made him even more conservative, shy, and wary than he'd been up till that time. Jennings had been sitting alone, having just started his lunch, when three members from another shop showed up at his table and asked if they could join him. He said that it was fine. As the three sat down, they introduced themselves as part of the gauntlet team that was just being wound down. Jennings mumbled something to the effect that he was sorry that they were losing their funding and returned to eating his lunch when one of the guests asked 
and what do you do? Jennings knew that he was working on top-secret projects, but these were fellow Dreamland participants and must be cleared to the same level, and so he simply said, Oh, me? I work in artificial intelligence development. Three forks moved as one, away from their owner's mouths. And the questioner continued without much pause. Artificial intelligence? You mean you're teaching machines to have intelligence and take over our jobs? Jennings thought to himself that it was odd that even here amongst intelligent scientists that there was still an overhanging angst about artificial intelligence. He tried to explain, well, I don't think in the next five to ten years you have to worry about that. I mean, we need a lot more processing power than we have available. Anyway, our goal isn't to replace humans. But the questioner wouldn't let go, and his two compatriots joined in the conversation, or more aptly named, interrogation. But that computing power is just around the corner, isn't it? It was a rhetorical question because the individual who posed it kept going. I mean, look where we've come from in the last 25 years. In 1980, we had computers that could barely handle a spreadsheet. And now we're unleashing small devices that can put your entire music library on them. Next, we'll see cell phones that start to integrate a lot of programs that we can only speculate about today. Aren't you afraid that you'll end up building something that threatens mankind? Jennings was taken aback at this line of questioning from a fellow scientist. He decided that it had been a mistake in expressing what he was working on and decided that his lunch break should end. He simply said, that's not the goal of our project, and I think to harbor that attitude is alarmist. Jennings got up, dumped the remaining contents of his lunch tray in a nearby garbage can, and walked back to his ATCO trailer. It was going to be difficult to convince people that artificial intelligence was not a threat.